in Tennessee. Green Welcome back to the story of liberty. This is John Bona. You may have heard of Davy Crockett. I grew up hearing songs about Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Remember Davy Crockett? He gave a great speech before the House of Representatives. He was perhaps best known for his role in the 1836 defense of the Alamo. Also, he served three times in the United States Congress from 1827 to 1835. The life of Davy Crockett was incredible, and he learned the true meaning of our Constitution, the importance of adhering to our Constitution, and the perils of ignoring its restrictions. It's recorded what I'm about to tell you, that one day in the House of Representatives, a bill was taken up appropriating money for the benefit of a widow of a distinguished naval officer. Several beautiful speeches had been made in support, and the speaker was just about to put the question when Mr. Davy Crockett arose. He said, Mr. Speaker, I have as much respect for the memory of the deceased and as much sympathy for the suffering of the living, if suffering there be, as any man in this house. But we must not permit our respect for the dead or our sympathy for the part of the living to lead us into an act of injustice to the balance of the living. I will not go into an argument to prove that Congress has no power to appropriate this money as an act of charity. Every member upon this floor knows it. We have the right as individuals to give away as much money of our own money as we please in charity. But as members of Congress, we have no right so to appropriate a dollar of the public money. See, Davy Crockett knew the government was not benevolent. The government was a taker and a spender, even back in the 1800s. And what it took, it took from the taxpayers. Colonel Crockett continued. He said, some eloquent appeals have been made to us upon the ground that it is a debt due the deceased. Mr. Speaker, the deceased lived long after the close of the war. He was in office to the day of his death, and I have never heard that the government was in arrears to him. Every man in this house knows it is not a debt. We cannot, without the grossest corruption, appropriate this money as the payment of a debt. See, Colonel Crockett knew it was not a debt that the government could pay. Colonel Crockett said further, we have not the semblance of authority to appropriate it as a charity. Mr. Speaker, I have said, we have the right to give as much money of our own as we please. I am the poorest man on this floor. I cannot vote for this bill, but I will give one week's pay to the object. And if every member of Congress will do the same, it will amount to more than the bill is asking for. Colonel Crockett took his seat and nobody replied. The bill was put on its passage and instead of passing unanimously, as was generally supposed, and as no doubt it would, but for that speech, it received but few votes and of course was lost. Later when asked by a friend, why he had opposed the appropriation, Crockett gave this explanation. He said several years ago, one evening standing on the steps of the Capitol with some other members of Congress, when our attention was attracted by a great light over in Georgetown. It was evidently a large fire. We jumped into the hack and drove over as fast as we could. In spite of all that we could do, many houses were burned and many families made homeless. And besides, some of them had lost all but their clothes they had on. 
The weather was very cold, and when I saw so many women and children suffering, I felt that something ought to be done for them. The next morning, the bill was introduced, appropriating $20,000 for their relief. We put aside all their business, and we rushed it through as soon as it could be done. The next summer, when it began to be time to think about the election, I concluded I would take a scout around among the boys of my district. I had no opposition there, but as the election was some time off, I did not know what might turn up. When riding one day in part of my district, in which I was more of a stranger than any other, I saw a man in the field plowing and coming toward the road. He came up to me and I spoke to the man. He replied politely, but as I had thought, rather coldly. I began, well, friend, I am one of those unfortunate beings called candidates. And yes, I know you. You are Colonel Crockett. I have seen you once before and voted for you the last time you were elected. I suppose you are out campaigning now, but you had better not waste your time or mine. I shall not vote for you again, sir. That was a shock to Colonel Crockett. He said he begged him to tell him what was the matter. Well, Colonel, the man responded, it is hardly worthwhile to waste time or words upon it. I do not see how it can be mended, but you gave a vote last winter which shows that you neither have not the capacity to understand the Constitution. You are not the man to represent me. But I beg your pardon for expressing it that way. I did not intend to avail myself for the privilege of the constituent to speak plainly to a candidate for the purpose of insulting or wounding you. I intended by it only to say that your understanding of the Constitution is very different from mine. And I will say to you what, but for my rudeness, I should not have said, that I believe you to be honest. But an understanding of the Constitution different from mine, I cannot overlook, because the Constitution, to be worth anything, must be held sacred and rigidly observed in all its provisions. The man who wields power and misrepresent it is the more dangerous, the more honest he is. Crockett commented, he said, I admit the truth of all you say, but there must be some mistake about it, for I do not remember that I gave any vote last winter upon any constitutional question. No, Colonel, there's no mistake. Though I live here in the backwoods and seldom go from home, I take the papers from Washington, and I read very carefully all the proceedings in Congress. My papers say that last winter, you voted for a bill to appropriate $20,000 to some sufferers by a fire in Georgetown. Is that true? Colonel Davy Crockett replied. He said, well, my friend, I may as well own up. You've got me there. But certainly nobody will complain that a great and rich country like ours should give the insignificant sum of $20,000 to relieve its suffering women and children, particularly with a full and overflowing treasury. And I am sure if you had been there, you would have done just as I did. The man responded, it is not the amount, Colonel Crockett, that I complain of. It is the principle. In the first place, the government ought to have in the treasury no more than enough for its legitimate purposes. But that has nothing to do with the question. The power of collecting and distributing money at pleasure is the most dangerous power that could be trusted to man particularly under our system of collecting revenue by tariff, which reaches every man in the country, no matter how poor he may be. Worse it is, it presses upon him without his knowledge where the weight centers, for there is not a man in the United States who can ever guess how much he pays to the government. So you see that while you are contributing to relieve one, you are drawing it from thousands who are even worse off than he. 
If you had the right to give anything, the amount was simply a matter of discretion with you. And you had as much right to give 20 million as 20,000. If you had the right to give to one, you have the right to give to all. And as the Constitution neither defines charity or stipulates the amount, you are at liberty to give to anything and everything which you may believe or profess to believe is a charity and to any amount you may think proper. You will easily perceive what a wide door this would open for fraud and corruption and favoritism on the one hand and for robbing the people on the other. No, Colonel, Congress has no right to give charity. Folks, that's what I'm saying. The government is not benevolent. We have drifted so far. Listen to the remainder of this story. It's true. The man continued. He said, individual members may give as much of their own money as they please, but they have no right to touch a dollar of the public money for that purpose. If twice as many houses had been burned in this country as in Georgetown, neither you nor any other member of Congress would have thought of appropriating a dollar for our relief. There are about 240 members of Congress. If they had shown their sympathy for the sufferers by contributing each one week's pay, it would have made over 13,000. There are plenty of men in and around Washington who could have given $20,000 without depriving themselves of even a luxury of life. The people have delegated to Congress by the Constitution the power to do certain things. To do these, it is authorized to collect and pay monies and for nothing else. Everything beyond this is usurpation and a violation of the Constitution. You see, Colonel, you have violated the Constitution in what I consider a vital point. It is a precedent fraught with danger to the country. For when Congress once begins to stretch its power beyond the limits of the Constitution, there is no limit to it and no security for the people. I have doubt you have acted honestly, but that does not make it any better except as far as you are personally concerned, you see that I cannot vote for you. Well, Davy Crockett was changed that day by that man at the plow. Davy Crockett said, I cannot answer him, for the fact is I was so fully convinced that he was right. I did not want to, but I must satisfy him, and I said to him, well, my friend, you hit the nail upon the head when you said, I did not have sense enough to understand the Constitution. I intended to be guided by it and thought I had studied it fully. I have heard many speeches in Congress about the powers of Congress. But what you said here, sir, at your plow has got more hard, sound sense in it than all the fine speeches I have ever heard. If I had ever taken the view of it that you have, I would have put my head into the fire before I would have given that vote. And if I ever vote for another constitutional law, I wish I may be shot. Well, there you have it, folks. Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier, one day came to know and understand the Constitution of the United States. And what do we see today? The growth of government spending has been accomplished by a significant change in the types of programs being funded. Only one-fourth of the federal government spending is now used for the more traditional government purchase programs, such as defense, transportation, physical resources, commerce, and international affairs. More than 60% is now used for transfer payments. The kind of payment Davy Crockett said he would have put his head into a fire before he would approve that vote. 
These include direct payments to individuals and grants to state and local government. These kinds of payments, Colonel Davy Crockett said he would take a bullet for then vote for it. See, when the payment of interest on the national debt is added to the amount spent on transfer payments, non-purchase spending equals three-fourths of the total federal government spending. Do we wonder why we're printing money hand over fist? Do we wonder why we have a $16 trillion debt that's growing over a trillion dollars a year? Do we wonder why we don't even have a budget? Because our Congress cannot pass a budget. It's fiscal insanity, and the economic earthquake is sure to come unless something is done. Davy Crockett knew it almost 200 years ago. It's time we wake up, America. Balance the budget now.